All right, so let's start. So we are in the SIG API machinery talk today, and um, we have two speakers. It's Abu, who's here, and um, Mike Spreitzer, who prepared a video which Abu will play. And it's about priority and fairness. And for those of you who have no idea what this means, a few years ago, when we didn't have that, one controller could basically kill the API server by sending too many requests. And basically, we depended on client-side throttling to be configured correctly. And we are in a different world today, 2024. And the work for that is basically in priority and fairness. And this feature in the Kube API server and Abu and Mike are the ones who have basically pushed that and implemented that. So let's welcome Abu. Thank you, Stefan. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the IP Machinery SIG Deep Dive. Um, so um, Mike couldn't be here in person. Um, we have a pre-recorded video from him. Um, so I'll start uh, by playing his video. Hi, I'm Mike Spreitzer, here to give you a brief overview of the API priority and fairness feature in Kubernetes. This is a feature in the Kube API server and in the generic API server library that we use to build similar API servers. This feature regulates the load on the API server in terms of the number of requests that it is actively serving at a given moment. The purpose of this feature is to protect the API server from the clients and to protect the clients from each other. This feature is based on, the, on attributes of a request that participate in authentication and access control so that it cannot be easily fooled. This feature thus is taking into account both the request rate and the time it takes to serve each request, because the product of these two is, on average, the number of concurrent requests. This is one-dimensional regulation. This is an approximate technique. It's a good approximation, and there are a few twe tweaks to make it better, which we'll see later. This feature replaces the max and flight filter, which is an earlier filter that is simpler. It classifies each request into one of just two categories, mutating or read-only and treats all requests of a given category at the same. APF is more granular, it's also configurable, and it introduces queuing, and APF introduces some fairness between clients. Like the max and flight filter, APF uh, rejects requests using in the standard HTTP way, which is the status code 429. Let's look at where the APF feature fits into the API server. Stefan Szymanski gave a good talk a few years ago at KubeCon about the overall structure of the Kube API server. Here we're just going to think about the hand chain of handlers, uh, so-called filters, that do some general purpose processing of each request on its way into the server. The APF filter starts by doing classification. For each request, this determines the priority level that the request belongs to and puts the request into one of the queues at that priority level. Each priority level has a certain number of queues that it is configured with and has a dispatcher whose job is to take requests from the right queue at the right time and send them on for further processing. In a way, it keeps the server as busy as requested and allowed, but no more so, and do so with some fairness. Let's look at request classification. This starts with configured objects called flow schemas that say how requests are to be classified. Each flow schema has a name and a numeric matching precedence, which is used to put the flow schemas in an ordered list. Classifying requests consists of, starts with uh, comparing each request to the flow schemas in order to find the first one that matches. Each flow schema is configured with some matching rules that, that say which requests match it. The result of this is two things. One is it says which priority level the, the flow the request belongs to, and the other is it classifies the request into a flow. In other words, for each priority level, the requests are classified into flows. A flow is identified by a pair of strings. The first string is the name of the flow schema that the request matched. The second string is extracted from the request according to a, a rule, which is a choice that the flow schema is configured to make. A flow schema can make one of three choices. One is that the second string in the flow identifier can be the namespace of the object that the request will act on. 
Another choice is that the second string will be the name of the user that issued the request. The third choice is that the second string will be the empty string. The flow identifier is the input to shuffle sharding, which is used to put the request into one of the queues in the priority level. A priority level is configured with a fixed number of queues and a so-called hand size, which is the size of the subset of the queues that will be considered for a given request. Shuffle sharding will use the flow identifier as a source of random of entropy to make a pseudo-random choice to pick that subset of queues. The request then gets put in the queue among, in that subset that has the shortest length. So you see there is a distinction here between the number of queues and the number of flows. The number of flows is not so well controlled. It is dynamic and it can be quite large, impractically large, to service the number of queues. Shuffle sharding is a neat technique for mapping a large number of flows onto a small number of queues in such a way that any one or few big flows do not crowd out the other flows. Now let's look at dispatching. Each priority level has a current concurrency limit. That is, roughly, the maximum number of requests that the server can actually be working on at a given time of that priority level. These are based on nominal concurrency limits. The nominal concurrency limits are derived from server capacity and configured concurrency shares. Each priority level is configured with a number of nominal concurrency shares. The server's capacity is divided amongst the priority levels in proportion to their nominal concurrency shares. These nominal concurrency limits are a baseline that is then tweaked periodically by borrowing to produce the current concurrency limit. The purpose of borrowing is to allow a relatively lightly loaded uh, priority level, a level that is lightly loaded at the moment, to be able to lend some of its concurrency to uh, other priority levels that are heavily loaded at the moment. Each priority level is configured with a number of queues, and there is a dispatching algorithm that is inspired by the fair queuing technique from networking. The uh, detail, we had to adapt that a bit to our use here. The details are in the cap. And this, this algorithm then is the thing that takes requests from the queues and chooses which queue to take requests from and send it on to further processing. A priority level can be configured to not queue and instead just reject excess requests like the max and flight filter did. Also, there are limits on queuing. Each priority level is configured with a limit on the length of its queues, and it's also, there's also a limit on the time that a request can spend waiting in a queue. So a request can be rejected due to either of those limits as well. Finally, there is one uh, priority level that is exempt from regulation. As mentioned earlier, there are some additional considerations. One is that APF will consider some requests to occupy more than one seat. That is to say, be relatively expensive or heavyweight. The leading example of this is a list request that returns a large number of objects. Such a request, compared to others that take the same amount of time to execute, is exceptionally expensive to handle. And so we, APF will consider such a request to uh, be worth uh, more than one request. The next consideration is watch requests. Whereas the max and flight filter simply did not regulate them, APF does regulate them. A watch request is a request to do one or two things. The main focus of the watch request is to keep the client appraised of changes to a collection of objects uh, on an ongoing basis over some period of time. Some re watch requests additionally will start by informing the client of all the pre-existing objects. This first phase which is or is not there depending on details of the request, is much like the ordinary short-lived transaction requests, and APF will manage the phase, that first phase as such. And once that phase is over, APF considers the request to be done, even though in fact it continues on to notify the client of ongoing changes. The costs for those notifications then, uh, APF associates with the other requests that are actually making the changes. So for request that writes or mutates an object, the, even though the um, reply goes back to the requester in uh, promptly without waiting, APF will consider the request to execute for a while longer to account for the cost of sending those watch notifications out to the watching clients. 
Another additional consideration is for the exempt priority level that has a nominal concurrency limit and participates in borrowing. This can be used to somewhat even out its effects on the other priority levels. Finally, uh, the last one I want to mention is rejections. The 429 status code, one of its standard features in HTTP, is a recommended time for the client to wait before trying again. For a long time, Kubernetes always set that to one second. Recently, we've made that adaptive so the clients can do a better job of backing off. So that completes the brief overview, and now Abu will take over and give you some more interesting details. All right. <clears throat> Let me just quickly um, skip through the slides. Mike just covered. Okay. All right. So let's do a quick recap on how <clears throat> APF handles a request. Um, so a new request arrives. We find a matching flow schema, and we compute the flow of the request. Um, the request is enqueued using shuffle sharding, and then we ask the scheduler to dispatch. So the scheduler uh, dispatches the request that should be executed next uh, using the fair queuing uh, technique. At this moment, the scheduler will also dispatch as many requests as possible, um, and then the request basically um, waits in the queue for a decision, right? If the decision is accept, um, the request will get executed. Um, if the queue wait time threshold exceeds and the scheduler cannot accommodate the request, right? This will be, the request will be removed from the queue and then rejected, right? So that's kind of the, of, like how APF handles a request. Um, next slide. So, um, APF is highly configurable uh, via API objects. It ships with a set of flow schema and priority level configuration objects. We refer to them as bootstrap configuration. Uh, the left column shows the um, flow schema objects available um, in order of their matching precedence. Um, on the right, we have the available priority level configuration objects. Um, a flow schema object is assigned to exactly one priority level. On the other hand, a priority level can be shared by multiple flow, flow schemas. Okay, that's the next slide. Um, so let's go through some of the um, bootstrap flow schema objects and uh, why they're there. Um, so exempt, this flow schema matches uh, all requests belonging to the system masters group uh, that means if you're a cluster admin, you fall into that category. And these requests are always exempt from APF regulations. Uh, next, we have system leader election. It matches the leader election requests from Kube controller manager and Kube scheduler, right? This traffic is critical for cluster availability, right? Uh, then we have endpoint controller. It matches the requests coming from the endpoint controller. Uh, that manages the uh, endpoint objects. Um, I think this is critical to keep the service network um, functional. Um, then we have system node high. This flow schema matches the heartbeats from the, uh, from the nodes, I mean, kubelet. Uh, we, we need this for system self-maintenance, right? And then we have kube controller manager, kube scheduler. Um, these matches the, tra the leftover traffic from their respective components, right? Uh, we have service accounts. It matches any leftover in-cluster traffic. So if you have a workload that's running as a pod, most likely <clears throat> the, the requests coming from your workload will match this flow schema. Um, global default matches any leftover traffic, right? including uh, any un unauthenticated traffic or any traffic that is external to the cluster, right? Catch-all, it serves as a catch-all for any unmatched traffic. Um, under normal conditions, no requests would match this flow schema because um, the flow schemas that are, that are above like, act as a net to match like, all requests. Okay, so we talked a bit about, oh, sorry. Um, so um, during startup, the Kube BI server uh, ensures that all bootstrap configuration objects exist on the cluster, right? It also periodically 
scans these objects uh, and applies any update necessary, right? That means any changes to the spec of a configuration object will be stomped by the API server. Uh, for the changes to stick, the cluster operators must set the auto-update spec annotations, annotation to false. Um, the goal is to enable the Kube API server um, to update these bootstrap objects installed by the previous releases. Um, also at the same time, uh, not overriding the changes made by the cluster operators. Uh, all right. So cluster operators can add their own configurations if needed. For example, um, if you have a buggy workload uh, that is known to run amok and flood the API server, uh, you can actually define uh, a dedicated flow schema that matches the requests coming from your workload and then assign it to a priority level with like a small uh, concurrency share, right? Uh, all right, so we talked a bit about the flow schemas. Now let's switch to um, priority levels. So we'll start with server concurrency limit. Uh, it is the maximum number of seats uh, the in-flight requests can occupy at any moment on the server, right? So APF uses it as a fence for protection. So it'll try to prevent the load on the API server going beyond that fence. And Mike just mentioned it's the kind of approximation, right? So um, <clears throat> server concurrency limit is uh, calculated by summing these two server run options. Uh, if not modified by the cluster operator, the default server concurrency limit is 600 um, on any Kube API server instance. It's also worth mentioning that a request on the server can occupy one or more seats. Um, it gives us a granular mechanism to deal with um, requests that have variable costs. For example, Mike mentioned getting one object versus um, getting a list of hundreds of uh, objects, right? Uh, so <clears throat> each priority level has a property called nominal concurrency limit um, that is basically the number of execution seats available to it, right? So uh, let's see how we actually um, distribute the server concurrency limit among these different priority levels. So each priority level API object has um, a field called nominal concurrency shares. It it's basically uh, prescribes a fraction of the server concurrency limit uh, that is available to that level. Uh, we use it to compute the nominal concurrency limit of that level. Um, and more and, and higher value of nominal concurrency shares basically means more um, nominal concurrency limit to that level. Uh, and it, at the expense of every other priority level. Um, the pie chart here shows uh, the default distribution of the server concurrency limit um, on a vanilla cluster. Okay, so next slide. Uh, okay, so uh, each priority level like enforces its concurrency limit uh, independently of the other, other levels, which introduces like this utilization challenge, right? So if we uh, look at the figure, um, <clears throat> priority level B uh, is underutilized. It is um, running well <clears throat> below its concurrency limit, right? On the other hand, priority level A is saturated, right? If you look at the YOLO line, uh, it shows a moment where the number of executing requests for priority level A has reached the concurrency limit, and there are an excess number of requests waiting in the queue. So what happens to those access requests for A, right? They will either wait longer in the queue before served, and this will introduce additional latency in the response time, right? Or uh, in the worst case, they will be rejected by APF, right? Um, so how do we solve this problem? Um, if we allow A to borrow from B some seats, right? Then uh, we can help resolve the situation. So APF um, <clears throat> basically allows um, borrowing among priority levels um, there are two fields that basically prescribe how many seats a priority level can lend to or borrow from other levels. Uh, so lendable percent is the fraction of the nominal concurrency limit of, of a priority level that other levels can borrow from it. Um, 
Borrowing limit percent is basically uh, the limit on how many seats a, a priority level can borrow from other levels, right? Uh, this table here shows um, the um, borrowing configuration for some of the boot level, uh, bootstrap uh, priority levels. For example, leader election, this priority level, uh, it doesn't land to any other level, but it can borrow without limit. Um, so <clears throat> another interesting topic uh, worth mentioning is priority inversion, right? It is a case where in the course of serving a request, some other request gets, gets spawned to the Kube API server. For example, um, in the figure below, um, there, we have a cluster extended by aggregation, right? So user, user sends a request A, Kube API server proxies the request to the aggregated API server. The aggregated API server uh, spawns a new request B uh, in order to serve request A. Um, so B is subject to APF regulations, uh, independent of A. So if B is rejected by APF, as a, conse as a consequence, A will fail, right? Um, some examples are delegated authorization, where the uh, aggregated API server um, is in response to serving a request. It actually issues uh, a subject access review to the Go API server. Um, there are other examples, um, Kube API server issuing requests to itself uh, over local loopback um, client. Um, I think there is also examples of ex external uh, admission webhook server issuing requests to the Kube API server, right? Um, which itself is acting, uh, basically serving callouts from the Kube API server. Uh, so how do we solve uh, priority inversion? Um, APF doesn't have any mechanism to detect these spawned requests. Uh, the way we're solving priority inversion is basically um, exempting uh, the spawned requests. So basically, uh, you have a flow schema that matches the, um, the requests, um, the, the spawned requests, and assign the flow schema to an exempt priority level. Um, for example, um, for the delegate authorization, uh, we, here we are matching the, the traffic, right? So subject access reviews uh, are matched from that aggregated API server, and we are assigning them to uh, the exempt priority level. Okay, okay. so let's talk about uh, client and retry. Uh, so when APF rejects a request, it sends um, 429 status code, which means too many requests. It also adds um, the retry after header uh, in the response. Um, the value of the header basically um, tells the client how long it should wait before the next retry, right? Um, so if, if your workload is built with Client Go, um, you don't have to worry about um, retries. Client Go automatically retries uh, the requests. Um, okay, I'll stop at that. Um, I'll talk about a couple of situations where APF can help. Um, so. In most production environments, Kube API server runs as a pod, and Kubelet um, probes it periodically uh, so that it knows when to restart it, right? Uh, if the API server is overloaded, it may reject the health probes from Kubelet, uh, further degrading the cluster, right? And we can prevent this situation by exempting um, the liveness probes to the Kube API server. Uh, there is another situation. Um, this is a watch storm incident. Um, it shows um, it, it basically from a HA cluster with three Kube API server instances. Um, the graph shows the number of watches over time. Each line represents a unique Kube API server instance. Um, and it shows the number of watch requests active on that particular server instance. And the gap on the line shows a time window where um, <clears throat> the API, that API server instance was unavailable for the duration. If you look at the highlighted area, um, it, it shows that the blue instance died and all the watch requests from the blue instance almost immediately reestablished on the green instance. So this sort of watch storm can like overload the API server or in some instance can crash it, right? So this is one of the many uh, cases of cluster degradation where APF can come to the protection of the uh, API server. 
All right, I think. Um, APF um, adds, um, uh, has a set of metrics for observability. Uh, I'll just quickly go through some of them. Um, so this one is a rate of requests dispatched um, for each priority level. So we can see how many requests are serving per second. The next one is, um, this one shows the number of requests currently executing for each priority level. This one shows number of requests currently waiting in the queue before they are served. And this histogram shows like how much time a request waits in its queue before being executed. And it shows it uh, for each priority level. I think that's it. With this, I'll stop for uh, questions. Oh, shit, yes. Oh, the default, uh, so it's a client setting. The default value is 10, but I think um, an author can actually um, modify that settings. Are you referring to the, um, the... Oh, I see, yes. No, um, yes, you can actually change the... the these are actually... Oh, oh, sorry, your question was, can... Yeah, no, I'll, I'll go back to the slide, yeah. Oh, this one? Okay. There you go. No, this one, sorry, this one, I think. Oh. Yes. So the question was like all the different configuration, you said there's default value from like API machinery that's set in the core right now. Um, you said operators can reset them or set them to different values if they want to. Is there any specific type of use case you see people having for this type of cluster you want to build, you want to set different values or? So, these are designed in a way that um, it's enough for, uh, or an ap approximately enough to you know, prevent, um, to have the API server functioning even during the deg degradation, right? Um, you can, a cluster admin can actually change those objects. These are API objects, basically. And a cluster operator can change these objects, um, but it's not recommended. I think only uh, use cases you are you are you, you are experience, uh, experiencing and de degradation in the cluster, and you find out that some priority level here is does not have enough room. Maybe you can tweak it to make room temporarily. Um, this is maybe one scenario I can think of, but um, usually we um, we recommend that the operators. Um, first identify the requests that are valuable to them, right? And then try to see if there is a flow schema that matches it. Otherwise, you can create your own flow schema object, and then you can assign them to the desired priority level. Yeah, that was gonna be the follow-up. I think in the graphs you showed, one of the example was like a special type, like OpenShift one, that was a custom bootstrap configuration probably made as well. Like in the in the graphs that you had shown, I think one of the custom type was like that. That was going to be the follow up, but I think you already answered it. I see. Okay. That you can create custom configuration. Okay. I cool. See, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, is there any is there any kind of guidance on how much to tweak the amount of seats available? There was 600 as uh, the default from the maximum yeah. flight, but uh, as a function of uh, course. RAM you allocate? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think we're still trying to find that answer because this is all like a very uh, rough approximation, right? So when we say that APF uses this as a fence for protection, but it's definitely not an accurate fence, right? So um, 600 means uh, you can use the number of cores to map to this value, um, and you can run experiments and see uh, like how well it performs. Uh, it also depends on the workload you have, right? Some, like, not all workloads will act, like, similar uh, on the APS over the side, right? So, because requests have different costs. 
Yeah, thanks. So request traditionally had a timeout of 30 seconds. What can I expect here? How long does my request stay in those queues? Okay, so uh, we made a recent change. Um, the queue wait time is uh, depends on the request timeout. So um, how do you specify timeout on a request? Um, a user can specify in the request parameter, like timeout equal to 10 seconds, right? Um, I think we limit the request timeout at, uh, on the server side to be at most 60 seconds for the sh regular requests. And <clears throat> the queue wait timeout, like APF queue wait timeout, is basically one fourth of the request timeout. Uh, previously, it was like hard coded 15 seconds. Now it's like based on the request, actual request timeout. If the user doesn't specify a timeout, on the server side, we default it to 60 seconds. So it'll be 15 seconds um, for those requests. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I just have a quick series of questions. So the bootstrap config, I assume you can't delete because you're saying if you make edits, it reconciles unless you override. It, it, yes, um, okay. if you delete, the controller will recreate it. Okay, great. Uh, second question. Did you drop then in client go the request per second client side throttling? We have not yet, but we did an experiment in um, Kubernetes CI, in, in upstream CI, by disabling uh, the client throttling for uh, everything in KK. Uh, and uh, we have some results to like share for that. Like, uh, but I mean, the, the result looked good, but it's not in production. I think it's the, in production, client go still enforces the, the, the client rate limiter. Do you know when you'll drop? Uh, we will want to see how it performs in production. Usually, um, the production environments are not up to date with the latest releases. So I think there will be some soak time, and then we'll probably have to figure okay. it out from there. So you're there. saying there's no upstream tests for that production environment? That uh, we, had a, we had a test. Uh, I think it ran on the 5,000 node okay. test. OK, uh, awesome. For, you said client go does retries. When does the 429 conflict or the, the rate limiting? Does that stall? Um, like, does client go wait and retry their request? So essentially, if you're a controller author, does that mean you'd be stalling reconciliation when that happens? Yes. So client go, if it sees uh, a 429 or any 5xx, and it also sees a retry after header, uh, and the header has a value like today's in integer, so it'll sleep for that number of seconds before the next retry. Is it possible to configure ClangGo to pass that through to the controller author so they could essentially requeue? The yes, I think an author can um, like set the uh, retry um, the retry count, uh, but the actual wait is basically instructed by the server, right? So server sends a header. It says you should wait like three seconds, and the client will wait three seconds before it's trying. Yeah, yeah, the reason I'm asking is because like, for some controllers, you have like two concurrent reconciliations at a time, as an example. So if you have two of those hitting a potential retry because you're hitting some resource um, endpoint, there could be other work to be done in, while, the, while it's waiting for those retries. That's why I was wondering if um, what your thoughts are on that? Um, if I remember it correctly, I think the the request that the client object that sends a request, um, it's I think in the same thread, it's the same go routine as the um, as the, uh, like um, as the application. So I guess there would be this. I don't think there is any way for you to to avoid that that latency. That, that block. Is, you're yeah. saying. Okay. Um, I think that's all I had. No. Thanks. But if you have an application that is built to, you know, be concurrent, um, like independently, that's something I think the author has to consider, I guess. Yeah, that's, that was a good point. Um, <clears throat> I guess adding to that, just it would maybe make sense to have an error type with timeout for those if you set retry to one, then it would give you an error instead saying that, well, you should, the controller should wait or requeue after 
a minute or something if that's uh, the thing. So that is something we probably could add to the client go. I think in client go. Um, Just inform the controller that. I see. Well, okay. But in client go, I think if you specify the timeout, right? Uh, the server enforces the timeout on the server side, but the client also will wait at most that many seconds. So let's see if you say timeout equal to 30 seconds. Um, if it, the server takes longer, the client will time out after that 30 second. Even if you have retry count available to you for retries, I think it'll just, it'll be like context timing out basically after 30 seconds. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thanks for working on something really, really hard and subtle. Thank you so much. Hey, it's me again. I have one more. Um, if I do something like similar to the endpoint controller and do endpoint management, should I be reusing that um, uh, that priority level, or do you recommend I create my own? That, that's a very good question. Um, if you have your own flow schema and you want it, you want to assign it to any of like these. Um, very critical priority level, uh, you run a risk because those priority levels will be shared to some extent, right? Um, and you, it, your, if your workload is, you know, can run MAC and flood the API server, it could impact those more important requests, right? Uh, I would say, like, you know, if you have, if you're not sure, I think the best bet is to create a new priority level and assign your flow schema to that level and start with that configuration. Thanks. All right, we're done. Oh, thank you so much for coming.